This is Mac OS Ken. A couple of positive notes on Apple. Spotify may be in for a surprise, and Apple's problem heads back to the Daily Show. It is Thursday, the 25th of January, 2024. I'm Ken Ray, and this is news from Mac OS Ken. Brought to you by yours truly and supported by people like you, patrons through Patreon. Find out more and add your support at patreon.com slash macOSCan. While JP Morgan analyst Samik Chatterjee says there is no point in reading anything good or bad into the Apple Vision Pro numbers with less than a week of orders so far, Wedbush analyst Daniel Ives is reading good things into the numbers and sharing what he sees. Apple 3.0 ran part of a note he wrote Wednesday. According to the analyst, when Apple's MR headset was announced at $3,500 a pop, watchers expected launch orders of around 70,000 to 80,000 units. Six months later, orders over weekend one are tracking closer to 180,000 in Ives' estimation. While J.P. Morgan's Chatterjee and TF International analyst Ming-Chi Kuo feel safe saying Apple will sell up to half a million headsets this year, Ives has up his sales expectation from 460,000 units to 600,000. While there are currently somewhere around 230 native apps for Apple Vision Pro, Ives and Co. expect that number to grow to 500 native apps by this summer, and he and his see Apple aiming for 1 million headset sales or more in fiscal year 2025. As for the future, the Wedbush analyst thinks this is the first of at least a few spatial computing devices from Apple. Over time, he's looking for prices to come down to about $2,000. He also anticipates form factors that are more like sunglasses and less like a prop from an early 90s sci-fi drama. He also sees Apple Vision Pro as the Cupertino company's first step to pushing into AI and eventually a separate AI app store, which he expects Apple to discuss initially at WWDC this summer. For Apple, the analyst says, the ultimate goal is that Vision Pro will work alongside the iPhone and other Apple devices over the coming years, with many consumer AI use cases set to explode across health, fitness, sports content, and autonomous. While many on the street are dismissing Vision Pro as noise, we strongly disagree and believe it's the first step towards a much broader technology vision that Cook & Company plan to push to its golden Cupertino-installed base over the coming years. If you'll pardon me editorializing, at first that felt like a reach, but it actually makes sense. Apple wants iCloud to work everywhere. Apple wants its virtual assistant, starts with an S, rhymes with Miri. Apple wants that to work everywhere. If Apple does a generative AI thing, it will want that to work everywhere. Or everywhere the hardware will let it. Doesn't feel like a direct leap from the headset to artificial intelligence but the idea does fit with Apple's wanting everything to work everywhere. Anyway, he's still pumped. Mr. Ives has an outperform rating on Apple's shares. His price target on the shares is 250 bucks. It's not just the prevailing winds in tech that make Apple's move toward AI make sense. It's also all the companies they're buying and the people they're hiring. The Financial Times ran a piece this week charting a course from here to generative AI on iPhone. According to the report, Apple has been more active than rival big tech companies in buying AI startups, acquiring 21 since the beginning of 2017. The paper seems to be buying the idea of Edge AI, saying Apple's goal appears to be operating generative AI through mobile devices which would allow AI chatbots and apps to run on the phone's own hardware and software rather than be powered by cloud services in data centers. That might explain Apple's relative silence around artificial intelligence versus the large amounts of noise made by the likes of Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. The piece has analysts like Mr. Ives of Wedbush, 
Needham analyst Larry Martin and experts in the AI field seeing more AI acquisitions ahead, as well as a possible AI focus at WWDC later this year. Now, before we get to AI's future, or next year's headset sales, or this summer's WWDC, or even next week's Apple Vision Pro release, there is a quarterly earnings call through which to get. Morgan Stanley analyst Eric Woodring wrote a note on that, parts of which were posted Wednesday by Apple 3.0. Basically, his team thinks Apple will have beaten December quarter expectations, but March quarter guidance is going to disappoint. As a result, he says he and his see Apple's next earnings report and call as a clearing event that will help to, one, reset next 12-month estimates lower, and two, allow investors to turn their attention toward what we believe will be a positive inflection in fundamentals in fiscal year 25, driven by an underappreciated edge AI refresh cycle and sustained gross margin and services strength. Additionally, if the street expresses disappointment in the form of some sort of sell-off, Woodring says he and his would be buyers of any post-earnings weakness. The analyst has an overweight rating on Apple's shares. Mr. Woodring's price target on the shares is 220 bucks. Now seems as good a time as any to remind you when Apple's next earnings report will be. It will be one week from today. Apple will release numbers after the closing bell on Thursday, the 1st of February, about 1.30 Pacific, 4.30 Eastern for those numbers. Half an hour after that... Apple execs will go to the phones, offering color and taking questions from people like Woodring and Ives. You can hear that call as it happens through Apple's investor site. It'll be made available as a podcast soon after. Bloggers will blog, people will post, and we will hit pertinent points right here on Friday the 2nd. Remember last week when Tim Sweeney, CEO of Epic, got all excited because developers in the U.S. were finally able to steer customers to places outside Apple's App Store to pay for digital goods and services? He seemed excited because he would finally be free of paying Apple's 30% commission for selling in the App Store. Then he seemed angry to find that Apple was still planning to charge a 27% commission Yeah, I only bring it up because I feel like we might be in for a replay of that in the coming days. This time, though, the part of Epic could be played by Spotify. TechCrunch ran a piece Wednesday that had the music streaming giant hyping changes it plans or hopes to make when the EU's Digital Markets Act, or DMA, goes into full effect in the first week of March. The piece points out the new rules prevent anti-steering practices whereby the platform owner, in this case Apple, prevents app developers from informing their users about alternative payment or subscription options. And the DMA also has provisions for preventing gatekeepers from requiring developers to use their own payment services. In a blog post, Spotify said that the DMA means it'll finally be able to share details about deals, promotions, and better value payment options in the EU. Or will it? Certainly Epic seemed to think that that would be the case here in the US. It said it will go to court against Apple to fight the extra App Store rules. All of that said, it's not just last week's Epic precedent that makes Spotify's outlook seem overly optimistic. The Wall Street Journal ran a lengthy piece Wednesday under the headline... Apple plans new fees and restrictions for downloads outside App Store. According to that report, the company will give itself the ability to review each app downloaded outside of its App Store. Apple also plans to collect fees from developers that offer downloads outside of the App Store, said people familiar with the company's plans. What do you think? Somewhere between 26 and 28% maybe? The journal says the restrictions and fees could renew tensions with app developers, some of whom had expected the new law to allow them to deliver their apps to users free of Apple's restrictions 
or what they see as a high commission. Really? That could renew tensions? How? Hey, how many versions of the song that never ends do you think Spotify has? Remember that time in 2021 when Apple sued NSO Group? NSO is the Israeli firm that made the Pegasus spyware. According to a piece back then from 9 to 5 Mac, Pegasus was developed with governments and law enforcement agencies in mind since the NSO group does not sell the spyware to regular users. Still, most of the countries that have purchased Pegasus are known to violate human rights, which puts people like journalists and political opponents in danger. That report said Apple sued NSO to prevent further abuse and harm to its users. Why bring it up over two years later? Because there is finally movement over two years later. Or a lack of movement, really. A piece this week from 9 to 5 Max says a judge here in the U.S. has denied NSO's request to move the case to Israel. NSO had asked for the move, saying going to trial in the States would be hard on a company that's based half a world away. But the judge pointed out Apple would have the same problem if the case was allowed to move, so... No. As next steps, the judge said, NSO will answer Apple's complaint by the 14th of February, 2024. A case management conference is set for the 4th of April, 2024 at 10 a.m., it is so ordered. So, there. If you missed it on the big screen, or just want to see it again as big as you can, Killers of the Flower Moon is headed back to theaters. Apple TV Plus issued a press release Wednesday announcing the re-release. It's a move that's no doubt meant to stoke Oscar buzz. On the heels of its 10 Academy Award nominations, the Cupertino streamer says the culture-moving feature will be re-released in theaters in partnership with Paramount Pictures for a limited theatrical run in 1,000-plus locations globally beginning this Friday, the 26th of January. And finally today, it won't be a daily gig, but Jon Stewart is headed back to The Daily Show. Relatively fresh off the relatively recent cancellation of his show, the problem with Jon Stewart on Apple TV+, 9 to 5 Max says the comedian and social commentator is headed back to his old show on Comedy Central for a limited run in more ways than one. While the piece says he will return as producer and host, he will only be hosting the Monday episodes. The show's correspondents will shuffle hosting duties for the other days, according to the report. The other limit... He is only hosting through 2024. A piece on his return from The Hollywood Reporter says Stewart's time back behind the desk kicks off on the 12th of February. Mac OS Ken, brought to you by me and supported by people like you, patrons through Patreon. Find out more and add your support at patreon.com slash macOSCan. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media. Online at backbeatmedia.com. You can reach me a couple of ways. Info at macOSCan.com or call 716 780 40 Eight zero. Until next time, that is news from Mac OS Ken. I'm Ken Ray. Ciao.